Thank you very much, Professor, for your kind introduction. And before I begin, let me also thank Rector Belawati and the leaders of Tirbuka University for making my participation here possible and extend my greetings to the distinguished members of your academic board and your governance officials that put together this fine event. And in particular to the staff and the secretariat of ICDE for the hard work that I know from my recent contacts with them, all of them have put into making this event a great success. It's my high honor and great privilege to extend to you the personal greetings of President Barack Obama, Vice President Joe Biden, the U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, and the Under Secretary of Education Martha Cantor. And in a moment, you will come to understand why my ability to speak these words on behalf of the President of the United States is such a remarkable and even improbable reality. So if you will, permit me to tell you a little bit about myself. Not because it is such an unusual story, but instead because it is a story that I think will be familiar to many of you. Perhaps familiar in your own experience, but certainly if not, then familiar with the people you know and the people you seek to serve. And in telling you this brief story, I think you'll come to understand why it is so remarkable that I stand before you here today conveying the greetings of the President of the United States and his most senior officials. As a young person, my sister and I, living in California, were unable to complete high school. Like many people who live in your countries and in this country, the opportunity for a high quality education seemed beyond my reach. In my case, I stopped attending school in my secondary years in what we call high school in the 10th and 11th grade because of adverse family circumstances. My father was no longer at home, my mother was ill, and my younger sister and I had to stop going to school in order to work so that we did not lose our house. At the time, we had a monthly mortgage payment to hold on to the house of $287.50. I'll remember that number for as long as I live, because every month my younger sister and I had the responsibility as teenagers of trying to come up with enough money so that by the end of the month we could give our mother the money that she needed to prevent our house from being taken away from us, $287.50. So, along with my sister, I went to work in a restaurant, in a pizza parlor, working 40 hours a week or more uh, in a job that was not an official job, like many people who work on an hourly wage. We worked and we would get paid each night from the owner of the restaurant in single dollar bills, depending on how many hours we had worked that night, and I would carry those single dollar bills back home, walking home, after the restaurant closed and we cleaned up at one o'clock in the morning each day. And the goal was to take these dollar bills and stack them up on our desk so that at the end of the month we had enough money to keep the house from being taken back. One day, when I was taking a brief break at work, I picked up the local newspaper. And in that local newspaper, there was a story. And the story was all about what the newspaper called 
high school dropouts, students who had stopped going to school. And the article, the writer, had filled the article with what I thought were a great many insults aimed at people in my situation. The article wondered why so many students were not completing school. What's wrong with them? Don't they know that education is the key to their future? They must be taking drugs or be in some way ignorant about the importance of school for them to voluntarily have taken departure from their academic studies. And I read this article and I was furious because I knew it did not describe me and I knew it did not describe my younger sister. And so that night, after walking home from the restaurant, I took out a piece of paper and a pencil and I wrote a letter to the editor of the newspaper and I complained to the editor of the newspaper about even the use of the word dropout. I explained in my letter that students like me and like my sister had not dropped out of education. We had been pushed out. And what's more, after having been pushed out, nobody came looking for us. Nobody seemed to care that we were gone. And I complained to the newspaper and said that as long as you continue to print false information about why young people do not go to school, you are contributing to the very problem that you are trying to solve. And I suggested that at a minimum, the first thing that the newspaper could do would be to stop calling people like me dropouts, which gives the idea that it is something we have done voluntarily, as if it was our choice, and instead start calling us pushouts. Because until the newspapers and the news media would accurately describe the reasons why young people were not able to take advantage of more education, there would be no hope of ever having the kinds of policies or programs that would enable people like me to get back into school. And I signed the letter, I wrote it in pencil on school paper, and I put it in an envelope and I mailed it off to the newspaper. And a few days later, in a moment that changed my life forever, the editor of the newspaper found me in the pizza parlor where I had been working for $1.75 each hour for the previous year. And he contacted me on a work break and he told me that he liked my letter so much that he wondered if they could print it as a guest editorial and pay me $50. And a career as a writer was born. In the years after In the years after that, I continued to work at a variety of menial uh, labor jobs in the pizza parlor, in the drugstore, for the moving company, uh, in, in other positions uh, like that. But I always wrote, and I would write at night or whenever I had opportunities, and I began attending community college, which was the one higher education institution in California and in the United States that had its doors open to me. And they did not care about my previous academic record. And I went to community college and I wrote and I began by sending articles to different newspapers and magazines, starting with the ones in my home area and eventually expanding uh, to other publications in New York 
and elsewhere. And by the time I graduated college, eight years later, after having been a part-time student, I was already a published author in a variety of prestigious national and international publications. My story is one of the power of education to transform lives. If it were not for the professors that I encountered at the community college that I attended, who saw in me and in my writings some seeds of talent that could be developed, I would still today not be standing in front of you, but I would still be working in that restaurant where, in fact, some of the young people who were my colleagues in that restaurant now 30 years ago are working still. To move the story forward, 25 years later, I had some success as a writer and as a media producer in the United States, working for publications like CNBC, the San Francisco Chronicle, Barron's, which is published by the Wall Street Journal, and others, and had worked as an international correspondent, traveling to Asia and this, what was then the Soviet Union, covering these areas, specializing in business and economics and in education. When I was approached by the faculty at the community college that I had attended 25 years earlier, and there had never been a graduate of that community college on its board of trustees. And the faculty invited me to stand for an open position on that board of trustees. The position in Silicon Valley in California for community college governance officials are elected positions. In some areas of the United States, community college governance is appointed by the governor of the state or other high-ranking officials. But in California, the highest ranking governance positions in the community college system are elected. And the faculty told me that they had never had a successful graduate of their school serve on their board of trustees, and would I be willing to stand for election? And of course I said no, because running in a public election is a very difficult thing, very expensive, I was not used to raising money, to asking people for campaign contributions. So the faculty went out and they began a campaign on my behalf. And they started to raise money and they opened up a bank account and they informed me that I was going to be a candidate. And after getting elected to that board of trustees, I was elected to be president of the board of trustees by the members of that group. And the reason that I agreed to do it had to do with the work I had been doing as a journalist in the previous 10 years, where I had an opportunity to write a column, a newspaper column, for the San Francisco Chronicle that was focused on the intersection between technology and public policy. And one result of my journalism was that I often focused on education because it was the area that was apparent to me where there was the greatest gap between what technology made possible and what was real in the world. And I could always find interesting things to write about in that gap between what technology would allow and what the structures of higher education were actually doing. And I saw in the opportunity to serve as a governance official and eventually as president of the Board of Trustees of the community college district from which I had graduated in Silicon Valley, an opportunity to change that situation. And we did that in the most simple but powerful way. And that action is another reason why I am standing here before you today with the great honor of sharing my experience and recommendations with you. 
because I had always wondered, as a journalist, why it was that when a poor student, like I was 25 years earlier, came to study at our school and wanted to learn, for example, mathematics, why the first thing that happened was they sent me to the bookstore and asked me to buy a book that cost $120. Now, I just explained I was working, making pizzas for $1.75 an hour. To be asked to buy a book on mathematics for $120, they might as well have just put a big stop sign in front of me. And I asked myself, really, in the United States, we spend $60 billion a year on higher education. Can't we find a way to provide students with a free resource that would substitute for that expensive textbook to help students learn mathematics? That was the first question I asked. That led to the creation of the Foothill De Anza Community College District policy on public domain learning materials, which are now called open education resources. And what we decided to do shortly after I was seated as president of that board of trustees is to create a formal policy, which was very, very simple, but extraordinarily powerful in the impact it had on our colleges and on our 45,000 students, and in fact, on our country, and now, increasingly, on the world. And what that policy said was that it will be the purpose of our community colleges and of the administration of our community colleges to support faculty members who wish to create or use or improve learning materials that are public and free. And we directed the administrators of our college to report back to our Board of Trustees no less than once a year on how successful they were in supporting faculty members who wanted to create or improve or use these free materials. And almost immediately, we had an outpouring of more than half of our faculty members, including the smartest, most sophisticated, most able faculty members in almost every discipline who volunteered to become involved in this effort. Because, as I am sure many of you are familiar with, most people who go into education and who become faculty members do it because in their hearts they have a strong belief in the power of education to transform lives. If they were trying to be very wealthy, they would have gone into a different profession. But instead, you know these people. You are these people. You know what's in your heart and why you were drawn to this profession. And what we did as a college is we said to those faculty members, if that's what's in your heart, if creating free learning materials that are high quality is what you want to do, it will be the purpose of our college, of our colleges and our administrators to support you, to find ways to give you the resources to allow you to make those contributions. And since that time, there has been an avalanche of faculty involvement in the creation of what are now known as open educational resources. The Foothill Community College District in California produced, for example, the first fully articulated, meaning that it um, is matched up with the academic, previous academic requirements of the college and university, the first fully articulated statistics textbook and later entire statistics course that's available for free for anybody who can get an internet connection and wishes to take the course. 
In that process of doing this, we have saved students hundreds of thousands of dollars each year just on the one campus for which these materials were developed. And since they were developed, they have been adopted now by dozens of other schools that we know about and doubtless many, many more that we don't know about, creating a net benefit that now must be in the millions of dollars from the act of this simple policy of an administrative directive to support faculty who wish to help their students in this way. So now perhaps you have a better understanding of why it is so remarkable that as I stand here and look out at you today and I reflect back on 30 years ago working in the pizza parlor and going home that night and writing that letter with the pencil that it would lead to all this and to the opportunities we now have in front of us. Let me talk with you a little bit about what happened after I was asked to serve President Obama in one of the highest ranking positions in the Department of Education, where I now sit just a few offices away from the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, who sees the President on an almost daily basis, and where I have an opportunity to provide advice and support to the President and to the Secretary of Education in accomplishing their ambitious goals for the United States and, in fact, for the world. Shortly after he was elected President, within weeks, President Obama made a bold and courageous promise to the American people. He pledged that his administration would support the creation of open educational resources. I remember that day very clearly because while I had supported President Obama's campaign, I was not one of the more uh, the larger donors. My wife is also a journalist, and we are, while comfortable, of modest means. And we made contributions financially that would not have brought us to anyone's attention. We brought sandwiches to the campaign headquarters and tried to help the volunteers who were knocking on doors to build support for President Obama. But to be given the opportunity to serve in a high-ranking position in his administration was not something that I had ever dreamed of or imagined. And there, a few weeks after he was elected, was President Obama pledging that his administration would support the development of what he called the Online Skills Laboratory, which, as he proposed it, would be a program that would go over 10 years and that would invest $50 million a year in the creation of open educational resources, free, high-quality, online courses that anyone with ambition and desire could take in order to better themselves and to prepare themselves for success in college, in life, and in careers. And I came to Washington as a political appointee to help pass this legislation and realize President Obama's vision for the Online Skills Laboratory. We had a tremendous struggle with the U.S. Congress, where we had many supporters and we had opponents who were determined, as they have been on many occasions, to try and prevent President Obama from succeeding in virtually anything that he promises or attempts. I've never seen, as an American, a situation where a president faced so much adversity after his election and so many people determined to stop him from meeting his promises to the American public. And we were unable to convince the Congress to vote 
on President Obama's online skills proposal to provide $50 million a year for the provision of open educational resources. But President Obama did not give up. And it turned out that at about the same time, there was a less controversial piece of legislation from 1962 called the Trade Adjustment Act whose purposes in the United States were to prepare workers who had lost their jobs because of international competition to prepare them for new careers. And we were able to convince the Congress to place into that legislation $2 billion over four years, $500 million a year, to help dislocated workers get the education and skills that they needed. The legislation said nothing about open educational resources. It left it up to the discretion, to the judgment of the Secretary of Education to determine how those resources would be spent. And shortly after that legislation was passed, the Secretary of Education announced that all of the learning materials produced by this $2 billion of U.S. federal money would be released as open educational resources to be used freely by students in the United States and around the world who could benefit from them. And last week, our administration announced the first round of grants under the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act of $500 million dollars ten times what the President originally promised with all of the intellectual property, all of the learning materials, all of the books, all of the courses, all of the lectures released free to the world as open educational resources accompanied with a Creative Commons by license which permits others to use and adapt and even sell those materials without any compensation having to be paid back to the U.S. government or to the original producers of the materials. It is the largest financial investment in open and the creation and improvement of open educational resources in the history of the world. Those grants were just announced the day before I left Washington. The recipients are now hard at work. The recipients are primarily two-year institutions in the United States, mostly community colleges. Some of them have received, some of them are consortia, groups of community colleges that have received individually $20 million apiece. And they have set to work on creating what will be the next generation of learning materials that will, I am convinced, begin and accelerate the transformation of higher education from a system that weeds people out to a system that lifts people up. And I am here today to invite all of you to participate with us, with the Obama administration, with the recipients of these $500 million in funds for the creation of learning materials, to participate with us in improving those materials, in using them, in correcting them, in sharing them back with us, in helping us to share them back with you, so that together we can bring educational opportunities to the people who, were it not for our efforts, would have no hope of ever achieving the educational successes that their uh, personal character and abilities would allow them to do. Now, why open educational resources? Well, let's think about it for a minute. It's really the reason I was drawn to it and drawn to writing about it more than 10 years ago now. What percentage of the world's population would you imagine has a real opportunity 
to have a high-quality post-secondary education. Is it 5%? I've heard different estimates. I think it's somewhere between, some people say it's 3%, maybe it's 5%. I'm talking about how many people can go to the best colleges and universities here in Indonesia. How, I know in the United States only a tiny fraction can be accommodated in the best colleges and universities that we have. That means that, roughly speaking, as an approximation, 95% of the world's population presently has no real opportunity to develop their human capacities and talents to the degree that they could be developed if they had the opportunity. 95%. But in that 95%, the riches of our generation reside. In that 95%, if there is a, someone on this planet who can unlock the secrets of cancer and cure diabetes and cure heart disease, if there is someone on this planet who can create the great artwork, the great work of literature, or the great piece of music that will help our cultures learn to live more fruitfully in cooperation and peace and in mutual respect. If there are those innovative breakthroughs, it is far more likely that they will be found in the 95% of the world's population who presently don't have education opportunities than in the f scant 5% who do. So part of our interest in open education resources is because it is the best tool, indeed the only tool that is available to us to unlock the talents and capacity of the 95% who without free access to high quality educational opportunities will not have a chance to develop their capacities. We do it as much for ourselves as for them because in unleashing the creativity and the human capacity, the theme of this conference, of that 95%, we will find the key to restoring global economic growth and development which has presently stagnated mostly because of a crisis in demand. The world economies are reeling in the US, in Europe and elsewhere and the most knowledgeable economists will tell you that the problem is a critical collapse in demand. The 5% they already have their homes Many of them already have two homes. They already have their cars. They already have nice clothing and all the food that they can eat. And the 5% cannot create the increased demand, economic demand, that the world needs for our economies to resume the kind of growth that we saw internationally in the post-World War II period. The only way to restore economic demand to sufficient levels to restore global economic growth, not only in the United States but around the world, is by helping the 95% of the world who don't have opportunities develop their educational capacities because educated people create more. They buy more. They sell more. They trade more. And once they're educated, by lifting them up and helping them lift themselves up, they can lift the rest of the world up. So we help the 95% through open education resources because it's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do, but it's also very much in our own self-interest, in the interest of anyone who wants to see a globally prosperous world where there is more to share for everyone. 
In supporting open educational resources, though, we've also discovered some things that I did not anticipate, even while I was advocating it along with many of the earliest advocates of open educational resources. Remember that when I began writing articles in support of OER, my primary concern was the cost of learning materials, which it seemed to me were excessively high and unnecessary. But as we started to use more open educational resources in the community college district and elsewhere, we discovered something that I did not anticipate, which is that the use of these materials actually improved the quality of teaching and learning. And we have begun to understand why that is. Some of the reasons are really quite simple, and it surprises me now that I did not anticipate them. In the United States, for example, and I don't know if it's true in your countries, but very often college students who buy expensive textbooks at the end of every course go and rush to sell those textbooks back to the bookstore or to sell them to another student because they cost so much they can't afford to hold on to them. But with open educational resources, students are able to build their own library of scholarly and literary materials that didn't cost them anything, but to which they can refer as they continue their studies. And it should come as no surprise then that students who rely on these materials often do better in subsequent classes because when they are studying one topic, they have the opportunity to go back and refresh their memory of things that they learned in the previous class where if they had purchased expensive learning materials, they might have gotten rid of them. Also, we've discovered that with open educational resources, it creates the opportunity for faculty members to collaborate and to cooperate and to share information about how they teach. And very often, once the walls are broken down between classrooms and it's no longer a secret what goes on in this classroom versus what goes on in the other classroom. The teachers are saying, you know, I never used that example before, but that's a better example than the one I've been using. Or, I never knew about that particular scholar and that particular scholar's work. Now I'm going to use it in my class. So it enables a more rapid transfer of best practices and of superior teaching methods. And we're seeing already that this is another unique benefit in building human capacity through open and distance learning in that it encourages faculty members to collaborate in communities of practice where they can share knowledge about how they succeed with their students and where they can transfer the best practices more re reliably. Let me focus on two other items quickly before I conclude because they are important for you to consider as leaders of the ODL movement internationally and in your own countries. And the first I'd like to talk about with you is the certification of knowledge. We recognize that learning in a higher education context requires many aspects. One is the effective transmission of knowledge and information and capacities to students. But the other is the certification of that knowledge, the reliable certification of that knowledge, which traditionally in higher education has been done by granting credits or diplomas which signify to all, once achieved, that the bearer is due some recognition for their academic accomplishments. But just as open educational resources is transforming the world of higher education and creating more opportunities for students, so too is a companion movement in certification and in the creation of alternate forms of industry-recognized credentials that I am fully convinced will be as important in the years ahead as ODL and open education resources are presently.
And I'll tell you this story uh, as it happened to me, because it was just a little over a year ago that I discovered the latest development in this area. And I can tell you in context that my professional job uh, years ago as a journalist working in Silicon Valley was uh, I worked for magazines like Inc. Magazine and, and Forbes ASAP, where my job was to cover startup companies, new companies that nobody had ever heard of, but that I was convinced would be important in the future. And so I wrote, uh, in many cases, the first articles that were published about companies like Yahoo or Cisco Systems, companies that later became household names, but at the time I discovered them had just a handful of employees. But I could see in them an activity that it was clear would make them important in the future. And I have the same feeling about what I'm about to discuss with you next. I was in Barcelona at a higher education conference sponsored, sponsored by the Mozilla Foundation. As many of you may know, the Mozilla Foundation is the organization that owns the Firefox web browser. And they receive money every year from Google because all of the searches done on the Firefox browser return the user to Google. And so they get, I don't know, $40 million a year, $60 million a year, something like that, uh, to continue their efforts. And they have two goals, the Mozilla Foundation. One is to keep the Internet open and free so that it's not captured by any one company that then excludes everyone else, and also to make education, high-quality education, more universally available. And I came to the conference, and I gave a talk very much like this. And after the talk, a young woman came up to me and introduced herself to me. And she said, you know, Mr. Plotkin, I'm a big fan of yours. I've been reading your writings for many years. And I very much appreciate what you're trying to do to reform the higher education system, to make it more accessible to more people. We really appreciate what you're doing, but we don't think you're going to be successful. So we've decided to replace the higher education system. Would you like to see what we're working on? And she invited me to the meeting of the Mozilla MacArthur Foundation Badges Working Group, which I had never heard of before. And I don't know how many of you may have. If you haven't, it's no embarrassment because it's something that is still very new despite how fast it is spreading. And I think it was maybe 9 or 10 o'clock at night that I joined a group of 30 mostly young people who were working in committees to develop a new system for certifying reliably higher education and educational accomplishments. And in a nutshell, in a, in, a, in a brief description, the way it works, at least in, in some of the ways it's been put together early on, is that students will take a series of courses or course materials in a particular area that's organized for them. And all of the courses and course materials are free. And once they have mastered those materials, they can petition to have their knowledge assessed. And the assessment is done by experts. In the first example that some of you may be familiar with, they put together courses and course materials that teach people how to develop web pages for the uh, Internet. And that once somebody has taken all of this uh, in instructional opportunities, all of which is made available to them for free, they petition to have uh, what they've done assessed. And they pay a nominal amount, $35 US, up to $85, I think, something like that. And experts look at their portfolio of work. And if they are judged to have successfully completed it, they are awarded what's called a digital badge, which has the seal of the organization that has certified their expertise in this particular area. And the student 
can take that digital badge and place it on their resume. And the woman said to me after I, a woman who was running this project said to me after I'd spent a few hours with the, the engineers who were developing this new system, which is now being supported by the Mozilla Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation in the United States, she said, think about this, Mr. Plotkin. Think about it 10 years from now, 15 years from now. You're an employer. And you need, it's Friday afternoon, and you need to hire a new employee for a mission critical job to start on Monday morning. And into your office walks two candidates for the job. One of them has a nice shiny diploma from an Ivy League college. And the other one walks in with a resume with 10 digital badges each one of which you can click on to see exact examples of the student's accomplishments in the areas that you need that worker to be an expert on when they begin work on Monday morning. Which of the two students, which of the two job candidates are you going to hire? And in the end, she asked me, isn't the certification of higher education knowledge and skills isn't one of the most important arbiters what, it, what that certification means in the marketplace. And then if you think, take it one step further, that the old certification system, the one we all grew up with, the one I grew up with, the degrees that all of you no doubt have, if that certification system can only accommodate 5% of the world's population, but this new certification system can accommodate the other 95% of the world's population. And if you assume that talent is evenly distributed around the world, which of the two systems will win? Now, I don't know if her bold prediction that she and her team working with these two foundations will replace the higher education system will come true. Perhaps I would not go that far. But I am certain, with all the conviction I can muster, that what they are doing by opening up opportunity to that 95% to have reliable certifications created of their skills, accomplishments, and talents will have an enormous impact on our societies, on our cultures, and on the traditional established providers of higher education. So I urge you to look into what's now being called the badges movement, supported by these two foundations, and assess for yourselves its importance and your ability to intersect with it and to work with it in ways that will extend the opportunities you are working to create for others. One last point before I conclude. We have many future challenges ahead of us in the world of ODL and online and distance learning. One of them that I spend a lot of time thinking about and working on on behalf of the Obama administration are the developments in technology itself. Right before I left Silicon Valley for Washington, I sat on our board of trustees as we were considering a purchase of a new technological system with a price tag of roughly $1 million U.S. to become the first community college in California to have a holographic projection system. Many of you know holograms. You see them proliferating, growing now in the world of entertainment. You see three-dimensional movies are now becoming more popular. And it is only a matter of time until what we grew up seeing on the television and motion pictures like Star Trek, where people and instructors and classroom environments can be broadcast fully in three dimensions. The system we were looking at 
at the Foothill De Anza Community College District was a three-dimensional holographic projection system that would allow biology students to visualize the human anatomy in all of its dimensions and with great magnification properties so that biology students could literally walk inside a human body or other organic structures and see for themselves how the different parts of the body and biological systems operated. The price and the power of these devices will grow faster than any of us can imagine. It stuns me to think what my six-year-old daughter will experience 20, 25 years from now when she visits her classroom. Will it even be called a classroom? One thing that it will do, though, is it will blur the lines between distance education already in Silicon Valley and in the United States Phrases like telepresence are beginning to supplant the old idea of distance education. And it may be that even this organization may reach a day, perhaps in the not too distant future, when what used to be distance education simply becomes education because of the advances in technology which will allow students and faculty and groups of students to almost magically teleport themselves into a rough approximation of physical presence that will mirror what we find in conventional physical classrooms. The challenge that we have as we move toward this new future is to make sure that we do not leave behind the populations who we are, we are currently serving through open educational resources. And that requires a commitment on behalf of our governments and our best scientists to continue to develop new open technologies that interoperate with the Internet to preserve the ability to use these new delivery systems freely and openly as easily as we can use the Internet right now to transmit web pages and email. So I put this to you as leaders of the distance learning and open education communities, that this is a challenge for government policy, for scientific research and development, and for collaborative efforts between all of our governments and all of our international bodies to work toward the development of advanced Internet technologies that enable the benefits of holographic projections and other three-dimensional representational systems to be as available and as inexpensive as current technologies are today. The future is in your hands. It's in our hands together. Past generations have been able to look back on their time on this earth and recognize great opportunities to do enormously significant work. I remember when I was a young boy, I marveled at the U.S. space program and the idea that we could launch rocket ships that would take people to the moon and return them safely to earth. We watched in my parents' generation as scientists cured and eliminated diseases that for generations had been the terror of mankind. Smallpox, polio, things that our grandparents lived in fear of that are unknown in most parts of the world and indeed almost everywhere now and that are not anything our children have to worry about. What will be the similar accomplishment of our generation? I put to you that it will be your work. It will be what you have set your hands and your minds to through 
as demonstrated by your presence here today. Because we have, at the present moment, the tools and resources, the technologies, the intellectual property licenses, the will and the wherewithal to create the greatest expansion in access to high quality education and job training opportunities in the history of the world. Let me say that again. We have the opportunity to create the greatest expansion in high quality education and job training opportunities in the history of the entire world. That's our work. On the night that President Obama won his improbable victory in the primary season, in the campaign for the presidency two years ago in the United States, he stood before the American people and with humility he reminded them that we are the people we've been waiting for. To which I would add, our work together has only just begun. Thank you for your attention and good luck with your work at this conference.